yesterday evening during the meditation, I had uh, mentioned something about uh, an empty house. We're becoming like an empty house. Did everybody, was able, everybody hear that? So was anybody able to kind of get a, a little sense of what uh, that, that meant? An empty house. And this body, you know, is, is like an, a house. It's, you know, like the Buddha said, oh, house builder, you know, thou art seen. So the, you know, this house is, this body is a house. It's like you have a house at home, right? You got doors and windows. Well, this body has doors and windows. The mouth, the nose, ears, eyes, skin, and even the mind, the door to the unconscious mind. Uh, yeah. Well, people have uh, seeing eye cameras in their house when they leave, don't they? Security systems. So that's awareness. That's why I said, uh, you know, be like an empty house, but there's a sensitive microphone in the house. That means the senses, the sensitive, the nerve endings in, in our senses, called pasado rupa. And they pick up any kind of vibrations, like a radar, you know, anything that comes within range of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, skin, it picks it up just like radar when everything, when any plane or something comes in range of a radar, it starts blinking, isn't it? You've probably seen that on TV. So our senses are, are that similar, but yet our, our agitated mind or drowsy mind basically, you know, suppresses all that. And so we're, we're not, able to really pick up those uh, sensitive signals. So anyway, yeah, that was the meaning of the sensitive microphone. That's, that's awareness that, that knows but doesn't know. That means uh, awareness is often called the knowing mind. So that means there's awareness, but it's not interpreting, judging, comparing, even actually identifying what an object is. It's just the bare, what's called sense door awareness. Uh, and there's specific poly terms for, for that, which, which, pre, which precedes the grasping and the, the perception, the perception and the, and the reactions to objects. And that is basically what we would call like pure awareness. In where, where the sense of the eye is not uh, functioning. So, so whenever you reach a state of meditation where, uh, where the mind has, you know, become centered and grounded and you start to have a, a good sense of, you know, noticing things, then if you just kind of bring that little, you know, image to the mind, the empty house, just, you know, imagine what an empty house is. People are coming around knocking on your doors and windows. Yoo hoo! Anybody home? Yoo hoo! Yoo hoo! Nobody answers. <laughs> the answering is our reaction, right? So, uh, anyway, so that's sort of the meaning of it. But, you know, that won't work in, unless you've already reached a, that state of kind of uh, centeredness and calmness where. You know, you've stopped reacting for the most part to even, you know, uh, painful sensations and sounds. And, and so. <clears throat> and if, you know, you're able to hold that long enough, that, that's when that, that last bit of alka tablet or, you know, vitamin C effervescent uh, tablet you know, that last little bit, you know, and dissolves. Now, how many of you think you started to feel some, or 
could feel some really subtle sensations and even sounds. Like even sounds from the outside, even something you probably never would have even noticed, you know, when the mind becomes clear, it's incredible how many things that you could notice. I mean, you couldn't even count them in your mind because there's too many, but, you know, <clears throat> in a state of that kind of awareness, you know, you, you should be able to notice, you know, at least even 20 or 30 or 50 in the space of just a second or two. Because, you know, the, when the mind expands, what's called expanding mind, you know, in the 60s, they talked about expand your mind, right? So people took psychedelics and so on to expand your mind. Uh, but in the meditation is mind expansion. And that means we're, we're letting the awareness open up you know, to go to even out of the body to, to feel and notice so many uh, sensations or even within, within the body. Uh, and that's why feeling the outline, learning how to, uh, you know, just feel that big outline of the body, that, that's the, the fastest way or the best way to, uh, you know, to kind of do that. But hardly anybody ever, uh, you know, talks about it. But the, the Buddha did on one of his, uh, you know, in some of his meditation structures. He says, breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, feeling the whole body. Now, some Pali scholars or other people will say, oh, that doesn't refer to the physical body. That refers just to the breath body. Uh, you know, the whole in-breath from beginning to end, the pause, the out-breath. But, uh, you know, it can, it can also be actually feeling the whole, uh, you know, physical body. <clears throat> so, anyway, I just wanted to uh, just do a, a kind of clarify that kind of little, uh, empty house uh, uh, kind of simile that uh, you, know, you can, if your mind gets to that point, you know, you know, kind of just kind of feel like that and let that last little, you know, you're aware of the eye, the eye is still maybe in there, you know, a little bit, but, you know, then that becomes the focus. That's the last thing to let go of. You, know, you let go of sounds, you let go of itches, you let go of, you know, pain, you let go of your thoughts. And then, you know, that becomes the last little thing. Everything else is kind of, you know, vanishing, but you know, I am a good meditator. <laughs> you know, the I is still there. So you, then you have to kind of focus that wisdom on that, you know, that last little bit of the, the tablet, you know, and let it uh, dissolve into the background. So, you know, that's the way, you know, the meditation process, you know, uh, proceeds. A lot of people just get stuck on the breathing. But, you know, that, that's the what's next is that process of, you know, letting the sense of self fade away. But of course, that only happened when the hindrances have been weakened pretty much, not maybe totally, but 90%, let's say. Or, or that's why attaining jhana is... Uh, but you attain it through the mindfulness again. There's so much confusion about jhana. People immediately think it's just like, oh, it's not one little point and not trying to pay attention to anything else. Okay, that is, that can be a method, but it's, it's not the mindfulness and the vipassana sort of a method. Although it could be, but don't to get stuck in the, the PT and the sukha and just want to, you know, hang out with that. You know, instead you have to tune in then to the flow of impermanence and let the awareness you know, expand to include all the, all the senses, the vibration. Okay, so uh, we'll have our last uh, meditation in, from the retreat, so... 
Just try to sit in a straight posture. And just spend the first minute just moving the attention from the, the head down to the feet. Feel the sensations. Just close the eyes, feel your eyes in the socket. You feel your eyelids stretched over the eyeball. Feel those subtle live movement. And feel your face, relax the face muscles. Feel that sensation of the skin stretched over the front of the skull. Feel your nose. When you take a deep, slow breath, feel the air moving through the nostrils. And feel your lips touching together. Feel the dryness or the moistness in the lips. And feel your tongue inside the mouth. Your tongue touches your teeth. Feel all those different sensations in your face. Moving the attention down to feel your shoulders, relax the shoulders. The shoulders kind of pull back a little bit, keep the chin lifted up level to the floor. Feel the clothing touching the skin of the shoulder. You feel the weight of the arms hanging from the shoulder. Feel the clothing touching the skin of the arm. <clears throat> you feel your hands and fingers that are touched together, touch the body. Feel the subtle pulse of blood in your fingers, your thumb. You 
Feel the natural inward curve of the lower spine. Try to feel or imagine spinal column going up to the middle of your back, joining the lower body, skull. Just remember sitting, sitting. Feel the buttocks pressing the seat. Hardness of the earth vibration. Feel the, the way the knees are bent, feet tucked under the body, where feet press the floor. Feel all the different sensations of the feet and toes. Remember sitting, sitting. And then let the awareness come back up and rest on the eyes. Feel that outline of the sitting body. The camera lens of awareness. Sitting, sitting. All those different places we were feeling individually make up the outline of the sitting body. Keep feeling any or all of them. Whatever you can notice. Then begin some three-part breathing. It'll take four or six seconds to expand the abdomen, rib cage, and upper chest, holding the air in two to three seconds. Slowly breathing out, feeling the last bit of air go out the love. Feel that little pause at the end of the out breath. And then the next in breath. Keep doing that three part breathing. Until you get tired of it. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future.
Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, feeling the whole body. Tuning in to the four phases of each breath cycle. The expanding in breath from beginning to end. The brief pause. Contracting out breath from beginning to end. The brief pause. You can feel the sensations where the clothing rub against the skin, the stomach, your cage, your chest, producing those subtle sensations. Each of those subtle sensations arises and vanish very quickly. Even while feeling the breathing, sound can be heard arising and vanishing.
with each out breath, allowing the awareness to relax more and more into the present moment. In, in, sitting, hearing, out, out, sitting, hearing. Gradually opening up the flow of impermanence. So many other body sensations, sound, even thoughts of urging.
You're turning up the power of the mental microscope. You notice more and subtler detailed sensations. Sounds. Rising and vanishing through that expanded space. Present moment awareness. Let the awareness expand more and more. Notice more and subtler vibration, sensation.
you know, beyond the body. Just become like an empty house with nobody home. Some sensitive microphone throughout the house. that knows but doesn't know. Get a feel of that. That, that remaining sense of I or me dissolve with vast spans of present moment awareness.
you might contemplate parts of the Pachichi Samuppada, especially contact, producing feeling, craving, grasping. Observe that process if it arises. Contemplate the five aggregates of form, feeling, perception, volition, ego consciousness. Sound is material form, the idea of a bird chirping is a perception, liking or disliking, volitional activity, thought, the idea of I, the ego consciousness, it's all right there.
Anichavattasankara-upadavayadamino Upajitva nirunjanti Tesam upasamasuku Nati janam apanyacha Anya nati ajaitu Yam hi janan japanyacha Siri nibbana santiki Impermanent are all conditioned things. They arise only to vanish and pass away. Having vanished, having arisen, they must cease. The subsiding of them is bliss. And there's no concentration without wisdom. No wisdom without concentration. One who is both concentrated and is wise is close to peace and freedom. And thus spoke the Buddha. Did anybody feel an empty house this morning? Hmm? Well, that, that's anatta sanya. We talked about anicca sanya being the perception of impermanence, being able to notice how quickly so many sensations are arising and vanishing. And that leads to anatta sanya, which means the dissolution of the ego, the self. Uh, in that in that way, just being aware of it gradually, just fading out as you stop reacting to various uh, things, it starts uh, fading out, and eventually it will uh, completely flip or dissolve. That's the experience of, would be the experience of like entering the stream if you haven't already done. But uh, when we, a lot of people hear these terms, the Nietzsche, Sanya, not the, 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 you have a vague idea of what it, what it really means, you know. But, you know, these are directly, Ditti Dhamma, directly visible here and now if you know how to, to tune into it. Anyway, uh, so this last talk, I wanted to uh, and talk about uh, a little bit about the, the Noble Eightfold Path, which is you know the path, or the practice that leads to you know the end of suffering. Now we know that meditation is the you know the the method of of meditation, which we use to gain mindfulness, concentration. Uh, but, you know, that's not separate from our daily life. So the, the whole Eightfold Path is really a, a kind of meditation. As we've already uh, talked about, uh, I mean, you know, the eight 
a, the enumerated fold path is like a, you know, a map, a map of how to go from point A to B, point B, and you, you go from a point of suffering to a point of uh, happiness or liberation. And you know, just as you would use a map to drive somewhere, if you want to, uh, you know, drive from Ottawa down to, you know, Atlanta, some people say, oh, I don't need a map, I don't need a map. They can just get in their car and, you know, start driving and, you know, they have their favorite music on or they're, you know, chugging a beer or something, you know. <laughs> they, they miss the turnoffs and, you know, they wind up over in, uh, you know, Detroit or someplace or, you know, anyway. So, and just as there's lots of different maps and some of them are better than others, you know, road maps. So the same way with the map to go from suffering to happiness, there might be different uh, maps out there. But we have to trust the map maker. And the Buddha was a map maker because he'd been there, done that. He knew, he knew the, the, you know, the direct way, or he knew the, the smoothest way, or the most direct way. Um, so anyway, so right understanding really is, is basically that, that road map. And when, you know, right understanding is defined as understanding the Four Noble Truths. And the first of the Four Noble Truths is right understanding. And we talked already last night about the three levels of right understanding. So the first is, especially if, you know, now you people who are born, born up in Sri Lanka, then, you know, you've been hearing the Dhamma since you were very young. But for people like, you know, Native Americans or Canadians, and, I mean, people who were born in you know, these countries, a lot of us didn't even hear anything about the Buddha or Dhamma until we were already in our 20s or even more, especially in my case, you know. First time I, you know, heard about the Buddhism, I had to write a paper for a world religions class. I went and read some books and what? Where, where, where was this coming from? I, I never heard of this stuff. Four Noble Truths, Enlightenment, Nibbana, wow. You know? It's like, you know, Got excited about it. You know, I wrote a paper about it. Got my first A plus on the paper. The teacher wrote on the paper. But anyway, first and last one I ever got. <laughs> so anyway, I had this I had this intellectual understanding. But then at that time, this was 1971. You know, hard, no Buddhist temples at all in America, except maybe one in Washington, maybe some Chinese, Japanese temples in New York, San Francisco, but hardly any. There's no internet, of course, or hardly any books. So basically, I kind of forgot about it. There was no centers around. No one knew anything about Buddhism. So, you know, I forgot about it for a while. And so <clears throat> I didn't go on to develop chintamaya panya or the level of understanding that comes through reflecting and thinking about what you might have read and heard. And that's also part of right thought. The second step of the right uh, eight-four path is right thought. That means thinking about the Dhamma, basically. Although Traditionally, it, it lists the three right thoughts as the thought of non-greed, the thought of non-ill will, and the thought of non-cruelty. So basically, you know, but these form the bedrock of how to transform our mind. So, but it, it's not limited to just that. It would be considered, lim you know, just thinking about the dumb. Uh, but, you know, the eliminating greed, ill will, aversion, cruelty from the mind, you know, those are the, the very important parts of training the mind. But, uh, you know, just thinking about the Dhamma in general. Uh, 
And so, you know, I didn't uh, go on thinking about the Dhamma, but that intellectual, and then I went back to just, you know, getting loaded and, you know, getting into mischief and then, you know, traveling the hippie trail to India and getting put in prison in Afghanistan and all kinds of neat things, uh, you know, along the way. Because I hadn't, uh, you know, thought about the dump. And then when I got to Nepal, after, you know, as I mentioned, getting pris in prison in Afghanistan, can you imagine? And uh, getting out barely with my life, you know, I knew I had to turn my head around. And so I heard about the possibility of, you know, going to a meditation course in Nepal, in Nepal. A Tibetan meditation course at Kopan Monastery. Some of you may have heard of that from this place. Uh, and it was a course on intellectual, it followed the three phases of uh, right understanding. So during that course, it was one month, by the way, a one month course. Somebody said, Oh, there's a meditation course. Uh, oh, I want to go to that. He said, Well, it's one month long. I said, So what? You know, here, if you talk about a three-day retreat, oh, my God. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, so, in that course, they had a book with all the Dhamma in it, most of the major parts of Dhamma, Four Noble Truths, and the Four Paths, and Patita Samapara, all that, even in the Tibetan tradition. They had other things, too, but... Uh, and so we were taught to read a chapter in the book. And then the Lama would give one or two lectures on the same topic. So I was getting intellectual understanding uh, through the reading of the book, and then hearing it uh, you know, through the lecture. And then immediately after that, we had to sit down for one or two hours and contemplate it, meditate and think about it, which is like the chintamaya panya. And, you know, that every day doing that. So I was, you know, all this uh, uh, intellectual understanding, but then contemplating it too, not just, uh, you know, going one ear out the other, but actually, you know, like going back in their life and seeing how much suffering I caused myself and others through greed, hatred, and delusion. You know, egotism. You know, like, oh, it's a wake up call, right? And uh, then other things. So, and, you know, reflecting on the, uh, you know, loving kindness, developing that, and the, and the, the uh, repaying the kindness of your parents, and these sort of things. So, anyway, uh, so the, that system followed that, those three levels of. Uh, of you know, right understanding the intellectual, and then the, uh, the contemplation, the reflection on it, thinking about it, and then having powerful insights. And after two weeks of that, all of that was building up. It was like every time I read a new chapter or heard a talk, it was like you know there was this. It felt like that you know there was something stirring inside, and I didn't know really what it was. You ever had that feeling where something wanted to come up, like you need to puke something out, and it kind of caught in your throat or something, and you know, and finally just wow. <laughs> that kind of experience. It was it was kind of that way, you know, with the dhamma. Dumb, the and uh, so anyway, uh, but that's what you know the importance of uh, you know that uh, why the those three levels of wisdom, and then you know the. Once you get the right understanding and the right thought, then what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Clean up your mouth, right? That means right speech. So giving up all the four types of bad speech, lies, slander, backbiting, uh, you know, malicious talks, curse words, belittling people with, you know, ethnic jokes and all these sort of things. Uh, of course, frivolous talk is a little bit harder to uh, overcome, but uh, you know that doesn't necessarily bring any immediate bad karma. But you know the other three do. Uh, 
So anyway, so you practice right speech because so much suffering in our life comes through loose tongue, right? Slip ups, you know. Uh, it can be even the, the the pain and suffering caused by wrong speech to somebody at the wrong time can be worse than, you know, punching them in the nose or something. Or even stabbing them. Uh, as people tend not to forget you know, the, the people, how people talk. So anyway, that, that's why it's so important. The right speech. And then the right action. That's the observing the other precepts. You know, what we do with the body. So killing or abusing, harming somebody with the body and then the uh, Stealing and uh, and then the misconduct, sensual misconduct, because all these those three things are the main ways that we create the negative karma in the world. And then also comes after that the right livelihood. So that means trying to have a job or occupation that wouldn't cause you to directly or even indirectly break any of the other precepts. But in this day and age, it's kind of becoming harder and harder to find such a job that is totally free from some kind of corruption or greed and uh, the harming others, right? Even food industry, even medicine industry, you know, and uh, not to mention business and so on. So that's why, you know, you should have, try to have a job that wouldn't cause us to uh, be involved in those kind of things. And, uh, because, you know, you, you have to go home and sleep at night. You're worrying about, you know, and getting caught or found out, especially like secretaries and big corporations, you know, you have to keep the books, right? So that, you know, keeping getting all the taxes in order and all the other things and you know, and, and the boss comes by and looks over the shoulder. And, oh, why don't you change that uh, five million to just uh, one million? What? That's not honest. Well, ten people looking for your job. And so people feel, you know, pressure to do things that you know they know that are not right, right? And then you have to go home and worry about it, mate. Uh, or if you get caught, it might actually come back to you, not only in that situation, but so many other situations too. You know? So that's why those three, uh, right speech, right action, and right livelihood, are included in the, the group called the, uh, the skillful conduct, or sila. And the, the first two, uh, right, right view, right understanding, and right thought are included in the, the um, umbrella group of wisdom. And the reason for uh, following those precepts is twofold. One is to avoid, you know, the, the gross and obvious suffering that comes through it. People looking to hunt you down, to kill you or beat you for having lied, cheated, steal, rape, pillage, and plundered, or whatever it is. Uh, we put in prison in the horrors of you know, prison life. You know, one little misstep and you spend you know, 10, 20 years in prison. You know, one slip up. So, Anyway, uh, and the other one is that most of the hindrances that you have in meditation are due to having broken the precepts in the body. You know, restlessness and worry. That means, you know, restless and oh, so found out, you know, you know, even something you did 10 years ago, told a lie. Now people are finding out, you know, people have done that or somebody smoked marijuana when they were a teenager and now they're you know, 30 years later running for some office, you know, in America. Oh, he smoked marijuana, ooh. You know, <laughs> that's just a funny example. But it happens, doesn't it? We see it happening. 
and worse, other things. All these, you don't have to talk about it, you know. Especially with famous people that are always in the news these days. Anyway, so, uh, you know, that the, the purpose of following the precepts is so we can effectively practice meditation without being harassed and plagued by our guilt, worry, remorse, and fear of having, you know, done things in the past that we shouldn't have done or didn't do things in the past that we should have done. So, and then the last three uh, <clears throat> stages of the Eightfold Path are the right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So basically the right effort is effort to do all of the above. The effort to develop right understanding, develop, the effort to develop right thought, practice those uh, precepts. And then the effort to uh, practice the me meditation. And <clears throat> then the right mindfulness. And we've already been talking quite a lot about mindfulness. And basically that means learning how to be more centered and grounded in the present moment so you avoid making mistakes. So you move a little bit more mellow, mellowly, a little bit more centered, not rushing around so fast. And that's when people trip over things, break things, bump into others, and just basically, you know, get all stressed out because you're, you know, rushing around uh, so much. And then, I mean, that's the, the one of the uh, important parts of the mindfulness. But then let alone, of course, as you develop the meditation, then it helps you to gain concentration and, uh, you know, insights. And then the mindfulness, right, mindfulness is followed by what? Right, concentration. So that's, that's something a lot of people kind of miss. A lot of people think they should develop concentration first and then practice mindfulness. No, it doesn't work, not the way it works. Uh, that the mindfulness helps you to be aware of the hindrances so that you can overcome the hindrances, which is the prerequisite for attaining concentration. So, But again, there's different meanings to uh, the concentration, as I've already talked a little bit about. There's the, the absorbed concentration, and then there's the vipassana jhana, or the, the concentration that's achieved through practicing moment-to-moment -moment awareness, and that also suppresses the, the hindrances. And you attain the jhana, but you, you're maintaining awareness with the jhana, not absorbed in the, some kind of vacuum. <clears throat> anyway, so, uh, you know, basically, and all that, all those steps of the Eightfold Path, you know, they're depicted as in the Dharma wheels. I think you all know this. Am I wasting my breath? I don't know if you already know all these things, right? Uh, so it's depicted in a wheel. And all of those things need to be, you know, equally uh, practiced. Because if you have a bicycle wheel and, and with some broken spokes or, you know, loose spokes, what happens when you want to ride the bicycle? It's got a bunch of broken spokes or some broken spokes. In. Anybody? Have experience with it? No? Yeah, the bike would wobble. There wouldn't be very, a very smooth kind of ride. And eventually, if you rode too long, it may completely you know, collapse. So the same way, in the practice of Dhamma, all of those spokes need to be equally uh, practiced so that the uh, the practice and the, our life can, you know, slowly roll or move toward greater states of uh, happiness and less and suffering. 
where there's a there's a little saying that's on a lot of Dharma Center walls. You know, more uh, less drama, more Dhamma. <laughs> Uh, so, most of you know that those th those three groups, the, the Sila, Samadhi, and Panya, they uh, follow the you know all those eight steps of the eightfold path that are included in the Sila, Samadhi, and Panya. But usually, it's it's talked about in that order. See the Samadhi and Panya. How many have heard that? See the Samadhi Panya. See the Samadhi Panya. But what's the first step of the Eightfold Path? Panya. Or at least the intellectual Panya. So I would I prefer to enumerate those things as Panya, Sila, Samadhi. And this is how that works. Is the intellectual wisdom kind of gets you excited, gets you started, like what happened to me, right? Uh, but I, unfortunately, I didn't uh, immediately start practicing the, uh, the right thought. But, but the, so the right understanding, uh, that intellectual understanding gets you started, you then want to, to practice. And as you start, uh, Practicing doesn't mean this doesn't mean that you practice one and wait a year or two and then start practicing you know, right speech and right action <laughs> like that. No, it's not linear like that. But the the gradual development can be seen is that each one of those leads to the next. Because who's going to practice a right speech, and right action, unless you think it's going to bring you suffering? Look at all these people in the world that are causing them so much suffering by their actions and speech, right? Uh, so, you know, because they, they don't know, or they may know, but they don't know that, you know, they're digging their coffin, you know, they're uh, uh, creating the causes of suffering. And look what, so many well, thousands of people are dying <laughs> almost every day in you know, these places. Uh, and in other places too. So, um, the <clears throat> so the, the 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 panya, the intellectual understanding, gets you to start practicing. So you start practicing sila. You know, and then, you know, after a few months of not telling lies or not using bad speech or, or not just you know, smashing cockroaches and you know, other insects and or crawling around in the kitchen in the bedroom. Uh, or uh, you know other sort of things, and uh, you know you find out oh, getting better sleep, you know, not, not worrying about so much at night, you know, getting caught for having told a lie or stole something or, or something else, and so you can see oh, there's an effect here. And then as you start practicing meditation then you see that that helps your meditation. And then when you start getting insights, that means you, 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 know, you get an insight meditation. Wow, you know, I, I really could practice right speech a little bit better. You see the loophole, you know, I, I could, you know, I, I could, you know, just not kill human beings, let me not kill cockroaches or something, or, you know, kick the dog or something. So like that, as you, as you meditate and you get more insights, you see how you can purify your sila better. And so as you purify the sila a little bit better, then you see that the, you're able to meditate better. You get to the deeper levels of concentration. Because you're not worrying, you know, so many thoughts are not coming up in your mind. And then you get deeper insights too. So your wisdom then increases, your, your chintamaya panya increases, and then little by little even bhavanamaya panya, deeper insights. And every time that goes around like that, it uh, helps you to practice sila better, it helps you to practice uh, 
And then you, because of that, your meditation gets better and your concentration gets better. And then it, it, your wisdom gets deeper even more and it keeps going along in that way. So that's the way that we have to see the, you know, that, that practice and how all those things kind of, uh, you know, fit together. Now I wanted to mention uh, sort of the the difference between sort of just concentrating and uh, the development of uh, insight or the vipassana benefits. Uh, and we talked about you know even the Buddha mentioned about the two uh, pr approaches to practice. One is called uh, Samadhi Pubangama Vipassana, and the other is called Vipassana Pubangama Samadhi. And that means a person may choose to practice just the strictly one-pointed concentration. That means either Anapanasati, where you focus at the tip of the nose to gain an amitta, and then get absorbed in an amitta, or practicing kasina, some kasina type of meditations, or staring at a candle flame. But, but basically, these, these are just sort of concentration techniques where you can attain jhana, even up to the formless jhanas, if one could do that, but those are very difficult. Uh, and then once people get those jhanas, then it is said, then you, you come back and then practice vipassana because vipassana will be very easy once you attain you know, the jhana. So that's a you know very popular, especially in Sri Lanka. <laughs> they, they tend to favor that method more, and so on. But and the other is that you know practicing, starting off practicing mindfulness. And then attaining jhanas, I think I already talked about that, right? I mentioned that. Uh, and that is how you see it in most of the lists of uh, within the Dhamma. So we already talked about the Noble Eightfold Path, right? Mindfulness comes before right concentration. In the, uh, uh, the spiritual faculties, faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. Again, mindfulness comes before wisdom. Even in the uh, seven factors of enlightenment, it starts with mindfulness and, and concentration is the number six. So you can see in almost all of those lists, mindfulness uh, comes first. And it's a natural evolution that when you practicing mindfulness and you're able to uh, suppress the hindrances because you're aware, you know, when you say, oh, sleepy, sleepy, okay, straighten up, take some deep breaths. Your mind brightens up. And, oh, yeah. Otherwise, you just spend the whole hour like this. But you have to be mindful. And then to interrupt your thoughts. I mean, how many thoughts are moving through your mind? In one meditation, probably a thousand thoughts going through your mind. And half the time we get you know carried away with them and then oh, thinking, thinking. So that's because our mindfulness isn't uh, sharp enough. It's not grounded deep enough in the body uh, for the present moment. Uh, so anyway, the <clears throat> you know there's an analogy between just concentration and the practice of the, the vipassana or insight. Vipassana means seeing reality as it is. And how is the reality? It's anicca, dukkha, anatta. That means everything is constantly changing. And if you try to hold on and prevent that change or resist it in some way, either with attachment or aversion, problems arise. I'm suffering it. And there's no permanent entity or controller that really is 
owns or controls this process of body and mind. As I mentioned this morning about the, the ego dissolving, uh, anatta. So those are the, you know, the, oh. so in, in the, you know, in the mindfulness practice and, you know, the four foundations of mindfulness really is a complete meditation because it, it goes from A to Z, you know, it starts with uh, the breathing, it gets you into the body, and, you know, uh, it, to detach from the body and the feelings, perceptions, and by that time you're gaining concentration already, you're practicing the enlightenment factors, you attain third or fourth jhana, next step, bam, there's nibbana, if you're able to hold it long enough, and other conditions are right. So it's a very, it's totally a complete practice. But anyway, so I usually, I usually give the analogy of a jack-in-the-box. How many of you know, in Canadians, you know about jack-in-the-box? Besides hamburgers. Okay, so it's a, it's a toy, right? <laughs> it has a little clown's head or a devil's head on a spring. And you push it down in the box and put the lid on, and you just see the box. But when you take the lid off, what happens? The head comes up. Boing. And what does the head symbolize? Look at me, look at me. The ego and ignorance. So when you meditate, if you're successful in practicing just jhana, let's say you're able to focus at the tip of the nose and develop that uh, namita and then, you know, to suppress all the hindrances and enter into the super deep uh, uh, silence where you know most anything else is kind of you know disappears and you're just in this very deep kind of silence and awareness. That's like pushing the head down in the box. The concentration is you know the strength of the concentration kind of forces the hindrances down. Uh, but then after you come out of the meditation, if you haven't, you know, if that's all you did, uh, and, you know, just to hang out in Piti and Sukhu for a few hours or longer, then come out, then a little bit time after that, the, the unconscious mind starts stirring up again, and uh, those defilements come up again. So, that constant meditating just for that purpose of gaining what they call gaining peace of mind and, and so on is uh, although it's it's really necessary but it's not you know not enough and that's why the vipassana now in vipassana we don't we we suppress the hindrances but we don't uh, but even while we're practicing. I mean, you don't suppress the hindrances right away. It takes most people years to suppress the hindrances. Uh, you know, being being very effective at it. So you learn to deal with them by practicing mindfulness and applying right effort. You learn how to uh, replace the negative thoughts and, and with the wholesome ones. And then you, uh, by practicing sila, you stop uh, doing the negative actions that stir up those, uh, uh, you know, hindrances. And, and then as you're practicing vipassana, I mean, seeing the impermanence, tuning into the uh, anicca sanya and then the anatta sanya, uh, it's that insight. See, you're meditating while things are still coming through your senses. In samadhi, things stop coming through your senses except for being absorbed in that object that you're contemplating. And especially if you get into the formless jhanas, your, your mind is just in this infinite space, infinite consciousness, and there's no contact with the outside world. So you haven't transformed them. You just uh, sort of ignored or suppressed your anger, greed, and so on. You know, somehow you got lucky and were able to <laughs> You know, do that just with concentration. It's not easy, but some people can do that. Uh, 
but with the uh, with the vipassana, you know, we're keeping the senses open. Now we are in the beginning, like attaining some degree of concentration, like the excess con momentary concentration. Actually, is the the usually in vipassana that's what we're uh, developing momentary concentration, but it's still concentration, and it still suppresses the hindrances because it's moment to moment. So you're noticing, you know, any hindrance that comes up in any moment, you're noticing it. You're applying the appropriate antidotes to get it to uh, fall out. And by practicing sila, you're not uh, contributing to create more of that kind of uh, uh, actions that cause the hindrance. So those two work in hand, you see. You've got to be practicing sila too. And then you have to be cultivating the, the right mindfulness and the right effort to overcome them. But not in your daily life, going ahead and redoing, creating the, those negative actions that are going to keep uh, bringing guilt, worry, remorse, and fear and agitation. So... Anyway, uh, so as you develop that, when you get insights, you know, the, what do you call that in singular, vidarshan? Vidarshan and meditation. You know what, vidarshan? Yeah, vidarshan. That means insights. Right? So the, when you get the deep insights, especially the, the Sotapana, uh, Maga and Pala. Now some of you may not know what that is, but those are the real deep insights that uh, really start transforming the mind, destroying the hindrances and the, and the fetters. I'm not going to go into all that now and you can read about it. But, uh, so w when you attain... When you get that first glimpse of the, the, the ego totally dissolving and you, you have that transcendent kind of experience, that's very powerful. It's like a, like a powerful laser beam just cutting right down into the base of the unconscious mind and destroying the root of, of, of uh, you know, the delusion and uh, you know, the, the sakayadiki, the belief in itself. Momentarily, you realize, yeah, self disappeared. And you understand how it was created. You no longer believe in any kind of idea that there's a permanent self or soul that owns or controls the, this body and mind or, or the world. You understand now it's, it, it evolved through Paticca Samapada and things like that. Uh, so, anyway, that's like going into the box down to the bottom of the box, a little trap door underneath. You didn't know about that one. Did you? And with a pair of wire cutters, you go, and you cut one quarter of the spring. You cut through it one quarter. So when you take the lid off the box, the next time, what happens? It comes up only with three quarters of its previous power, right? So it's been weakened. It still comes up, but it's, it, you know, it's been weakened. And then, when you reach the next level, it's like you go in there again and cut another quarter of the spring away. And then when the head comes up again, it only comes up with half of its previous power. And then in third stage, the same. Another quarter gets cut away. And then finally, at the Arahan stage, you cut through the last bit of it. And when you take the lid off, well, the head doesn't come up, right? And why is that? Because there's no power anymore. So the power that drives our mind, you know, around Paticca Samapada billions of times, you know, in a second. Uh, is the greed, hatred, and delusion. So anyway, that's just a, an analogy to show uh, the difference between just 
concentrating, which suppresses the hindrances, as opposed to developing insight into a Nietzsche dukkha that goes all the way. See, with the concentration, you just push the head down and you, you compress. But the spring is still intact down there. But the, the vipassana insights, you know, as I already just mentioned, you know, go in and cut the spring. So that's the way we, you know, have to try to see the whole, you know, uh, picture of the Dhamma from, you know, beginning to, to end to have a, you know, at least a intellectual understanding of that. But then as you, you know, meditate, all these things that were kind of just ideas and words, you, they start to, you know, make more sense. And then finally you get those, uh, you know, powerful darshanas. Okay, so now I wanted to talk about, I know time is on, but uh, you know, after a retreat, how many people thought they, you know, got some insights during the retreat? Or how many kind of learned something new or different? Now, even about yoga, uh, three-part breathing. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that helps me concentrate. So, you know, when you, when you come to a retreat and you get some insights and uh, you hear things that, oh, there's a new possibility, how am I going to practice, you know? And so you get enthusiasm. How many already started making out the daily schedule? Starting with tomorrow, you know, you're going to get up, you're going to do 20 minutes of yoga, you're going to do 40 minutes of meditation, you know, twice a day. And normally, you know, the advice is uh, to kind of practice meditation twice a day for whatever period of 30 minutes, 45 minutes, or one hour. Uh, and so when people go home, maybe they're able to do that for the first day or two. And then because you've been on retreat and you had to work, you had to cover somebody else's job at the work site, right? You had to cover your days off. And now you have to cover their days off and you have to work later. So by the time you get home at night, you're too tired. Or the mind makes excuses, oh, I'm too tired. I just want to, you know, eat something and go to sleep or watch a horror movie or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, soap opera. Uh, so, so little by little, the first thing that happens is that eating meditation drops away. Because maybe you go home and not everybody where you live meditates or in your family and you don't have anybody to talk to. Now, a lot of you, of course, you have Dhamma groups, which is very good, but some some people don't have that kind of access. So they're not able to talk to people immediately about their practice or who can understand what they're going through. So anyway, we can kind of little by little lose that uh, initial enthusiasm. And so the, the evening meditation will be the first one to go. And then after a few weeks, you know, the 45 minute meditation may drop to 30 minutes. And then the 30 minute meditation after another couple of weeks dropped to 15 minutes. And before you know it, you're going out the door drinking your last bit of coffee and you pat the Buddha on the head and say, you meditate for me. <laughs> and that becomes all of your meditation. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sound familiar? So, Mokara Karan? Mokara Karan? So, you know, I know it's, it's a real issue and people have that. So we've come up with a new type of meditation for you, or for those type of people. And it's called an M&M. 
That stands for a minute of mindfulness or a minute meditation or a mini meditation, however you want to call it. But it's a specific practice. And I know most of you probably heard this already because I always give it as a part of my talk. Uh, where you, you train yourself to stop every hour during the day. You stop what you're doing. Even if you're at work and you're busy and you know, after finishing one assignment, one job, checking your email, before rushing off to, or rushing to do something else, <coughs> uh, pause, stop. And take a deep, slow breath, bring your attention to the body. And whether you're sitting or standing, just come back to this standing, sitting, standing, sitting, or, or excuse me, <laughs> breathing in. You know, standing, breathing, sitting, breathing. Uh, and take a couple of deep, slow breaths. And hold the air in your lungs for as long as you comfortably can. Because, you know, that's the most powerful way to stop your thoughts. So you pause whatever you're doing, you, just, you know, be still and take a deep, slow breath. Try to get air into all three parts of the lungs because it takes a total concentration to do that. And so while you're doing that, you can't really think about anything else. And you hold your breath in for several seconds. Train yourself to even hold it in for longer time because you can't think while you're holding the breath in. It's almost impossible. Or the thoughts would just be very, very kind of faint. I mean, they wouldn't, you know, because it's such a powerful feeling when you're holding in the breath like that, especially if you're feeling the, the body. And then you let out the breath. Maybe take two or three of them. Just two or three of those breaths is already one minute. And you may have forgotten about what you were rushing to do next or, you know, uh, chewing in your mind some ill will toward one of your colleagues uh, that did something. You know, you might have forgotten about. And, you know, while you're holding in the breath, you feel you know, this subtle, you know, life force sensation. And basically, you just relax. You know, bring the mind to the present moment. And you could even do it longer than a minute. But uh, even if, you know, once you learn how to do it, one minute uh, can be sufficient. And then you carry on doing what you do. Uh, and in that one minute, if you had did, did something in the last hour, if you got in an uh, argument with somebody or had some little feeling, you know, practice forgiveness. You know, if you're having your will towards somebody, you know, say, may they be well and happy. May this person be well and happy, free from their suffering. They do those things because they themselves are sick and they didn't really mean to do it. It's just their ignorance that's doing it. So, uh, yeah, I also have ignorance. So give them a break. You know, give them a break. Send them some metta. And then so well, hopefully you wouldn't go into the next hour with that you know, will in your mind. And you see the person again, you know, 30 minutes later, and then maybe smile at them. You know, they're walking by with a and you smile. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, so like that. You uh, by doing those M and M's every hour, you release your stress. Uh, rather than accumulating the stress hour by hour as a, a most unmindful people do. You know, they go from one situation, every hour something's happening. They get a bad phone call from their family saying somebody's sick or hurt. Or, you know, they get a phone call from the bank saying, you know, you lost all your stock market down the drain, or whatever. You get a notice from the doctor saying you, you just got a, a positive test on your, some test, you know, positive thing. <laughs> So that'll help you to, <clears throat> when that, any any kind of surprise news, hopefully if you, you know, maintain some connection with the body or, uh, you know, you'll be able to observe that reaction and maybe begin to freak out a bit, but then the mindfulness will kick in and say, oh, relax, relax, it's not that bad. And so it'll help you hold, hopefully to, you know, calm down and not rush into something that's going to compound your your problems. Uh, 
uh, right? So that's on, on a on a very practical day to day level. That's really one of the you know uh, prime benefit because that's why people have trouble you know say they're too stressed out and not to meditate because they've allowed themselves to accumulate all this stress without re releasing it right away because then it continues to fester in them. So that if you can practice those M&Ms during the day, then uh, hopefully you wouldn't feel so stressed out uh, or have so many negative thoughts in your mind and so that you might feel like doing a long meditation in the evening. <clears throat> so, you know, that's the uh, basically the, the that idea of the M and M, but you have to do it really every hour. Just doing it once a day is not probably not going to be enough. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it can save you a lot of uh, grief. You know, during the day, you know, you, you catch yourself before you've uh, you know got, you did something or you're rushing around too much. So, and then apart from that sort of thing, even in the daily life, you know, there's different places. We spend a lot of time just standing around waiting in lines, right? In the supermarket or maybe sitting in the dentist's office or the doctor's office or some line at the, you know, the social security office or whatever. You know? Instead of looking around criticizing that person's hairdo or that person's clothing, you know, just you know, do an M and M there. Just you know, even if it's just for ten seconds, in the space of one, one deep breath. You know, you you have a, you know, you're walking down. You can do mindfulness. That's really cool. You know, practice walking meditation down the supermarket aisles. You know, and you have your cart, and you know, you know people are kind of <laughs> going around, <laughs> and. You're reaching out to get the last box of Cheerios. All of a sudden, an arm comes in from over here, grabs a box, <laughs> removes it, and emptiness. <laughs> or the lady starts to cut in in front of your cart, you know, and you're in line, and the lady with you, maybe a kid or two, or, you know, cuts in line, and says, a big overflowing cart, you only have like five or ten items. You know, everybody else is, you know, giving her ugly looks. Oh, come on, uh, you're in a hurry, you got kids, you know, come on. Compassion, practice compassion. Or instead of standing there and you see the magazine rack of all the tabloid magazines, right? And you see a, a headline, you know, Michael Jackson was reborn. <laughs> Donald Trump goes to jail. <laughs> so, you know, Keep your eyes in your head. Feel your feet. I'm sorry. Feel your feet on the floor. <laughs> These things sound funny, but you know they, they, they happen, don't they? So anyway, so there's you know the practice like this. This is little things, you know. This is really where the rubber meets the road. This is in your daily life out there is when you encounter probably ninety percent of your stress. You know, driving your car, and people cutting you off, and all kind of other things. And, uh, so that's when we really need to be uh, pausing and releasing the stress, practicing metta, so to you know, to keep our mind at least in some you know more calm state. Okay, think you can do that. You can carry a little pack of M and M candies with you. you know. they're, they're small and sweet, right? Well, these meditator M and Ms are also short and sweet. Okay. <laughs>